up, everybody? Welcome back to another BTR podcast. Once again, another NCAA heavy March Madness pod. But before we get into that, check out our first ever public video. Yes, we touched grass. We got out of the house. Concrete. Or concrete. Well, it's not like <laughs> grass. Yeah, whatever. Uh, but we went to the Canucks game. Canucks versus Buffalo Sabres. Obviously, this was a couple weeks ago before we got sick. Me first. And uh, we asked fans trivia questions. Shout out Crazy P, Vancouver super fan. Hopped on the video as well. Appreciate that. And also got some game highlights reaction as well. Um, yeah, so that was the last good game the Canucks, I think, played too. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you guys check that video out. We worked hard on it, especially this guy with the editing. I'll give him props for once. Um, so like that video, comment your thoughts on it, subscribe as well, because we're going to try to do more of those as we can. We have some big things planned. It's just like a matter of time. In fact, can we do it? But uh, in the meantime, yeah, let's just get right into it again, once again. Heavy March Madness, like he mentioned, NBA, NHL playoff implications. Next episode, we promise. <laughs> Undefeated South Carolina Gamecocks went 37-0 and to win the Women's National Championship and defeated Caitlin Clark and the Iowa Hawkeyes. Tenth team in Division One history to do that, to complete an undefeated season. I believe both men and women's. But in general, 10th uh, in the basketball to be specific. But yeah, um, yeah, let's talk about the winners. We, we have to talk about the winners. We'll talk uh, about Caitlin uh, Clark and later. We also got to talk about that, the UConn game as well, even though it feels like it's mm. been a lifetime. But It's only been two days. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, yeah, South Carolina, obviously before the season, they lost five starters. Uh, I'm pretty sure to the draft, but to the draft or whatever other reasons, maybe transfer for Senior portal, year, anyways, or whatever, yeah. right? And... Um, they, they were kind of already written off coming this year that everybody assumed that UConn would be back with Paige Beckers. LSU would probably repeat, if probably favorites to repeat with how their squad was. Um, obviously, you can't count Iowa clearly this year as well, who were also kind of being written off with losing some players as well. But no, Don Staley, I don't know if the coach of the years are announced, he, is coach of the year. Sherry got it, I think. Okay, yeah. So yeah, she well-deserved because what she did with this team, the freshmen going 10 deep, this South Carolina team had size, depth, shooting, defense, a p- traditional point guard, I guess you could say, in Raven Johnson, and uh, put off a masterclass. Obviously, started off very slow. This is we're reacting literally an hour after the game as well. Started off very slow. Caitlin Clark went on a heater, 18 points, setting up the record in the final for a first quarter performance. I but think qu- any back. quarter pro- performance, I think. In a, in a quarter performance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... Uh, yeah, essentially in the second half, what South Carolina is known for is that's when they pick it up. That's what they did and ended up closing this game out to, a, I think it was a 12-point victory. Yeah, a 12-point victory. They dominated the second quarter, 10-point lead, 10-point win in the second quarter, um, ultimately leading by three. Well. They were leading by three at yeah. halftime. And then, yeah, it was the middle two quarters. South Carolina in the final four also dominated the third quarter against NC State where they blew the game open after leading by, I believe, one at halftime. So they are definitely a great second half team. Again, is it like the perfect team, right? They're a if you want to be a dynasty, like we hear it said, we heard it, we get, we heard it said on post game. You need a coach, and a coach you could play for. Don Staley is the ultimate coach. She expects all, everyone, freshman to senior, to play to that gamecock standard, right? Have that good defense, and. It just shown all year, right? She's held the freshmen accountable as much as the seniors accountable. She's a great coach. She's also, I don't think there's anyone better, you know, in the last few years, right? Yeah, because like, G- I don't think Gino, Gino struggled a little bit. Tara Vanders, Vander, Vanderveer, Vanderveer, Vanderveer. Um, outside of the one win, was she's always there, but like hasn't won the big one outside of the first. The first year we started watching it properly. Uh, obviously, a couple of the Pat summits no longer no coaching, and I and uh, and there's Kim Mulkey and as then well. Kim Mulkey, who, who actually won it recently. South well. Carolina has set the standard these last couple of years, yeah. right? You know how like UConn has said it before, of how what to be a dynasty, right? What to be like that team, you know, that college slash university, and South Carolina has done it. Don Staley is that coach, and people want to play for Don Staley now. It's just plain and simple. I just want to correct my mistake. Pat Summit is also no longer with us. So not just no longer co- coaching. So obviously a legend. Towards many, I think she coached uh, Tennessee. So I think she was the coach eight, for like... I think Park eight titles for her. Yeah, well. exactly. Right. So yeah. Um, but yeah, <coughs> p- point of the thing is like they showed the, the graphic of the five coaches. 
Don Skilling is among one of them, right? I'm not going to call her the go. That could still be Pat Summit. That could still be Gino Oriyama right now. But like you said, the last, Three, I don't know four how many years, years they yeah. are the dynasty that UConn once was. Yes, they haven't won a record of how many wins in a row yet. But yeah. <laughs> clearly this year proved to many that you cannot count out what Don Skilly did as a head coach. She was so emotional at the end of the game that it showed why. Like she did not have, we didn't know what Cardoso was going to be. Uh, is she, was she going to be uh, Aaliyah Boston or Asia Wilson like she did in the past? Clearly, Cardoso is going to be a top five pick this year, in my opinion. Um, and that's what the mock draft also has labeled it as well. She's got like she got an Oregon transfer over. She got um, Tessa uh, Johnson. Freshman. Freshman as well. Another couple of other freshmen. Raven Johnson came back after ha- calling it Raven's Revenge Tour and said it was officially completed. Yeah, no, top to bottom, like you said, get a coach. Find a player that's a superstar esque. You got that in K- uh, Cardoso, um, or develop one. You got, like I said, that's her, and get a team that has no egos essentially. Yeah, no egos. They're one of, one of their best. The framework of their team was teamwork, right? Yeah. Everyone had a role, right? Raven Johnson had the defense and the uh, traditional point guard, right? R- facilitate the offense. Cardoso cleaned the glass, right? You know, you got Block three shots. point shooters. Who was that? Um, Pow Pow. Hitting threes. Yeah. Right? Perimeter. I think the story was like she was watching the game last year saying that, oh, these guys need perimeter help. That's where I come in. Transferred over. She did her job. Everyone had a role. All the roles of basketball was fulfilled with this South Carolina team. And it was 10 women deep. Yeah. That's exactly. The, that's the crazy part. Whereas like a lot of these other teams, for example, like the bench scoring, I don't know if I don't know if a bench like, player and I ended up <laughs> getting more than zero. No one. So essentially, that's where the game changed as well because thirty-seven zero, I believe. Yeah. So essentially, that's where also the game changed. You could you could rest some players, especially if someone's slightly injured, like a Cardoso and a uh, Raven Johnson were kind of knocked up from the NC State game. But but yeah, all all credit to this fr- uh, this school, this um, program because uh, if I'm South Carolina, make pay her right now, give her a lifetime contract. <laughs> because oh yeah, hundred percent. There's no way you should be letting Don Staley go. Um, Don Staley, unless she wants a WNBA or NBA opportunity that comes, that's a different story. But in terms of college, there's no other coach. And I'm like, lick, lick, we'll get to the uh, the impact of Caitlin Clark as on her comments about it in a second uh, later uh, when we discuss it. But was she? It's not like she's. Um, I, I no coach, to be fair, really isn't like an egomaniac. But then she shows how humble she is. Like all coaches are humble, to be fair. Like Kim Mulkey may look like a villain. And she might be hated on, but at the end of the day, she pays respect at the end of the game, no matter what, win or lose, right? But Dawn Staley does it, and she makes keeps her team in check. I think there was a couple of games ago where they blew a massive lead, and I forgot which player said, like, oh, yeah, no one could beat us. And then she commented to keep her team in check, saying, you guys just blew a 20-point lead, right? Essentially, just saying, shut up. <laughs> yeah, no. And the press like, conference. Uh, she's uh, but, yeah. like the coach, right? If she needs to be that strict, you know? She'll be that strict. If she needs, you know, just play along, let the players make the decisions. She'll let the play. She is all around, right? Yeah. She, uh, like I said, accountability. She holds them accountable. And then when she does good, she rewards them. Simple as that. Yeah. Um, so congratulations to the South Carolina Gamecocks, their third championship. Their second in the last three years uh, as well. One with Asia Wilson, one with Aaliyah Boston. And they're sending off Carmila Cardoso as a top five pick as an NCAA champion, as she said in her... Uh, post game, um, pre- uh, post game interview, or when the re- the championship mm-hmm. interview presentation, yeah. presentation interview there. But let's talk about Iowa. Uh, what happened here, and we'll touch on what happened in the, la- the semifinal here. The NC State game, we're not going to get into too much because there's more of the story. Was second half, South Carolina just dominated them, and that's about it, right? Yeah. All credit to them; <laughs> they played hard. Uh, but South Carolina was all, all, like I said, the better. Like we said, it was the better team. But Iowa, um, hot start. Kaylin Clark puts 18 points. Complete opposite of what was the UConn the game. UConn game, right? And uh, which surprised me a little bit. I'm like, why are you getting away from the game plan? Obviously, they went back to it when it looked like, okay, yeah, she's going to run away with it. And she was hitting those shots that you see Steph Curry usually hit as well on a consistent basis. It died down after that first quarter. But her uh, the playmaking was there. It was just, like I said, her playmaking reminds me of Luka. And uh, or even Jokic, but I guess more of a guard type. So Luca and it sucked that like some of the players couldn't finish those layups, and then they led to five point swings because, like it's like we said, South Carolina's shooting was insane, and they would capitalize on the tra- uh, transition. Um, 
let's go back to the uh, UConn game very quickly because uh, we're not going to talk about the ref impact yet, but let's see what, what happened because we got to shout out. Uh, what's her name? Nika Mule. No. no that's not a shout no, no, out. No, I'm talking about Iowa. Uh, the girl. Who oh, Stalky as well. Stalky. Stalky. Yeah, yeah. Stalky. Because uh, obviously. Caitlin was struggling a bit. She did get her 20 points. She got going in the second half, especially the fourth quarter, hitting big shots. Kate Martin struggled uh, very early, but she started hitting the mid-range shots that ultimately got them the win, right? And uh, yeah, but it was if it wasn't for Stalky, they would have not won that game because the UConn depth was usually better. And the reason why it had to come down to Stalky is because of Nika Mule. <laughs> uh, yeah, so now right? we can talk about that. Um, incredible de- defensive game plan. LSU bottled it when they with their game plan against Caitlin Clark, Gino Ariyama, and Nika Mule really nailed it down how to yeah. defend Caitlin Clark. And uh, you gotta have a stud defender. Nika Mule's a stud defender. And she held her Caitlin Clark in check for je- all four quarters, honestly. She held her in check. But she contained her. The and f- then obviously, team wise, they doubled her when they needed to, pressured her, blitzed her when they needed to. And it was an all around incredible defensive game plan. On the flip side, though, uh, get a good shout out to uh, Coach Bluter, Lisa Bluter. Because um, she made some adjustments in the second half because Paige Beckers didn't get going as well Like for the whole game. It was Caitlin Clark who ended up being the better player because she found her way uh, around whatever assignments they did. Because it was a similar game plan for Paige Beckers at the end of the day, right? And even though Paige did hit some big shots when she needed to at times, and it was just a defensive game plan. She had to get KK Arnold going, right? You got you already mentioned uh, Mule, uh, Mule hit... Uh, Mule big, had a couple threes. A couple big threes. The one big three that Edwards, Leo Edwards was a beast. Leo Edwards was a beast. I think her and Stalky were the, I guess, the players of for their teams respectively. Yeah. Because they they are the secondary stars, I guess, and they needed to get going. But speaking of Edwards, the ref call. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about that now before we go back. Yeah. To let's just quickly. let's just quickly get it. It's shit. It was terrible. It shouldn't have been called in that situation. Now. Yes, you know, you see the lean, you see the elbow, right? But, the, like, there's a gray area. That gets called in the second quarter. That gets called in the beginning of the game. But in that moment of the game, you took the opportunity for UConn players away to potentially, oh, well, take the lead. Potentially take the lead, right? Because they technically didn't make a shot. So here's the, here's my thoughts on it. You're right because you did not set the precedent of being called. That was not being called the whole game, Right? I would have still hated the call if you were calling that the whole game and let the players decide. The problem was you didn't set that precedent. At least you had a defense of saying, like, we've been calling that all game. What are you talking about? Then you could blame uh, Aliyah Edwards for that. So that's, that's problem number one. It wasn't the precedent yeah, of the game. That is cool. Um, yeah. Number two, yes, if you look at the replays, you have to go ultra slow mode. Really in slow mode, in slow mode to see it. Because in live time, there's you no can, way a ref yeah, could call that, right? You we just were kind of confused. And when you go to ultra slow mode, like there was literally frame by frame slow mode on Twitter to show. I'm like, okay, fine, that is. Problem is, there's no challenge for it, right? That's number one. And yeah. <laughs> number two, and this is something we talked about VAR. Anything you make slow mo looks worse. It does look worse, yeah, for sure. Right? Like for example, like in VAR, we said it, like a sh- um, the uh, the stud to the shin, whatever, it looks bad if it's freeze framed right there, right? And in this case, yeah, it did not affect the play because when you look at the thing, um. I uh, forgot who it was. Uh, Guardy, Gabby Marshall, I think. I'm not, who I'm got not. the call? She got the call. Yeah, so yeah. she actually got over the screen, and it would have been a good contest, right? Now we don't know. Like, yes, Paige said it perfectly at the end of the game uh, in her post game presser, saying that that moment didn't rob us the game. But in my opinion, she's just being, she was being the bigger woman. It robbed the opportunity of a potential defensive stop or a potential go ahead bucket. Go ahead bucket. Right? It, like it's not a. R- robbery right like it, because they were up as well yeah. they choked the lead Keep yeah that no mind. it's not that like you know you know what's a robbery the saints rams game from a few years ago yeah. when the rams made the super bowl and that, that pi that's DPI, a robbery yeah that's the reason being that is because you no know, saints actually yeah no it was a robbery this one it wasn't a robbery in the sense of there was still time on the clock we weren't guaranteed that if a bucket would have been in we or weren't or guaranteed that bucket you know because that's a guaranteed you know However many yards it was. Could have been like 30, 40 yards. Or a touchdown, whatever. No, it wasn't. It can't be a touchdown. Oh, yeah, DPI. Yeah, you're yeah. right. But yeah, <laughs> but one, I guess. I don't think I don't think it was closer to end zone. But uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is it wasn't a, a certified bucket. Yeah. Right? And UConn, they got a godsend to him because Caitlin Clark missed the free throw. And they did not rebound it. 
right? So in the sense, they kind of had a second opportunity that they didn't, you know, take a grasp of yeah. as well. And but no, and like my conclusion from my side, terrible call, bullshit call. It should not have been called and uh, it was terrible. I'm not like the one that's saying that, yo, NCA or refs wrecked the game for this person just because that. I can't argue. If one of you guys say that, I can't argue. That's with the president set now, right? Because yeah. going into this final, it's like, oh, after, literally after the game, it's rigged. Kate, they want Kate to win it all. all well, obviously, she did it. Because clearly, if they wanted her to win it all, they would have rigged it some way or on another. But yeah, no, going back to it, just let the player have the opportunity, right? Let Paige Beckers, who was probably going to shoot it or make the play, to find the open woman or whatever the case was to make that opportunity and end it on that note, right? Even the final, there was the refing, um, not I want I'm not gonna say errors, but there were like ref moments, like the ref were trying to be the, the main character. Yeah, I no, like that's the best way to say Staley it. Staley got warned in the first half. Clark got fouled a few times. Clark which, did foul, uh, and as also well. did foul as well. Right? Like it was, so, that that like the final was both sides. It was yeah, really a toss up. And honestly, this UConn game was a. Both sides as well, uh, up until that moment where it really favored yeah, Iowa. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it's unfortunate that that's what we got to talk about. And that's the because, like, again, it wasn't fair to Iowa who made a comeback, made adjustments. But yeah, un- it's unfortunate. UConn, they should be back next year. Hopefully, oh, yeah. they could um, figure something out. But yeah, going back to Iowa in the final very quickly. Yeah, it was just they figured out a game plan to stop Caitlin. And every it just seems like. They seem lost when Caitlyn does not have the ball and they're trying to force it away to get it to her. And that's the same thing happened in the UConn game as well. Uh, and yeah, unfortunately, that's not the case. You don't have like a secondary star like some people have. Like Angel Reese had Flaugé Johnson. Uh, Cardoso had Raven Johnson. and Or uh, the freshman that popped exactly, off, Tessa right? Johnson. <laughs> Paige Beckers had Aaliyah Edwards or also KK Arnold who went off and that game hurt who was their freshman. Right, so... I'm interested to see what happens with Iowa next year because, listen, I don't want to say Lisa Bluter is not a bad coach for sure, right? Because they were in the tournament before they even got Caitlin Clark. The question is, was it the Caitlin Clark show? Now, I believe... Ka- Ka- oh, yeah, it was the Caitlin Clark show. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, how much of it are you going to let that be Caitlin Clark show from going forward? Yes, she's going to have an impact on girls in Iowa where she's from. That's going to help for sure, right? Or girls in high school at the moment that might want to play for a coach like that. But next year will be the true test of uh, Coach Lisa Bluter to figure out if players want to play for her, like how players want to play for Adon Staley, maybe even a Gino Oriyama or a Kim Mulkey, Tara Vanderveer, whoever else, right? So that's what I'm, I'm intrigued to see. But there's one thing before we get to the whole impact of this thing. There's one thing we learned. We were talking about it before we hit record. We were watching it during it. This should be the game plan from every um, athletic director, every coach recruiting process. Find girls that are six five and taller, and make sure they do not go to South Carolina. Oh yeah, <laughs> and do find not let them go. Pieces and put them to your school. Exactly. Right? Convince them some way somehow. There's That's where a good coach needs to be. In if you want to be that program, get a coach. Get make sure that coach is you know earns the players' respect and the players want to play for them. And get big six five plus. Cardoso size woman and get a just a solid guard because they already got three boards like, sitting there. Like they have, there's like freshman pop. Like Tessa Johnson is a freshman and let her let them in scoring. Yeah, right. Hey, that's why like UConn like we're like I said we were rooting like I said for the um, Iowa thing when they beat UConn we were rooting for Kaylin Clark we didn't want that to be the ending of how it was. But then this year we're seeing it right now we're probably rooting for Paige Beckers to win next year. Let's see how it goes. But for them right now, South Carolina should be the favorite going out of it. It's obvious. Yeah. The only team that could have probably beaten them, in my opinion, was LSU because of the physicality aspect of it. I'm not saying even they could have even done anything close. But nah, yeah, no. It U- U- this is the real USC. Uh, yeah. Um, sorry, Juju Watkins, but the USC is University of South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say it's South. Okay. South, for this year, it's a uni- CU, if anything. But it is? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. But no, yeah, going I heard fans chanting USC, USC. Maybe. I got this is the real yeah, USC. Yeah, it's University of South Carolina. For, here, for right? this year, it's, this is the USC. But yeah, next year <laughs> we might have a USC squared final. Who knows? But like I said, next year UCLA, I think they have a big woman already there as well. Um, you have obviously Juju Watkins and USC. So it's going to be fun next year. And hopefully when Caitlin Clark gets drafted, this um, draft, it doesn't die down because we still have another superstar in Paige Beckers. Oh, yeah. And we have another superstar in Juju Watkins. And... Everyone in South Carolina and but so and on. Whoever so shows forth. up in South Carolina. Yeah. Right. So 
Let's talk about, let's talk, let's end it on this before we talk about the men's side. The impact, because we have to give her flowers, Caitlin Clark, and the impact she made um, in women's sports, et cetera. Because we, we got robbed of the opportunity from Sabrina Ionescu because of that COVID year, and I think it died down a little bit. And then once fans were allowed, and Paige Beckers came onto the scene, she got hurt. But obviously, while she was healthy and during her freshman year, Caitlin Clark was making some noise. But it was still UConn. It was, it was a Becker show. It, it was, was a Becker, Becker show because of the historic school of UConn. And then when she went down, everybody was like, oh, yeah, no one's probably going to watch. And here comes Caitlin Clark. And Don Staley, like I said, humble. Before they even closed everything, she took the mic back and essentially said, uh, shout out to Iowa, but shout out to Caitlin Clark. It literally said, you're the first overall pick with a girl on her roster. Yeah. But, but she did acknowledge that it's going to be with Aaliyah Boston, a former player of hers. But essentially says, thank you for being one of the, uh, you are one of the goats of college, let alone, because she did not win, so she's not going to be the goat, but she's still one of the greatest, setting all these records and the impact she made for all women uh, in basketball to the point where even some of her cousins that may not be a <laughs> big fan of women's sports or people we know that are big, not big fan of women's sports watched as well. Yeah. You got Alex Adams, who's a big proponent of it because he covers the PWHL. And we're, we got, we sat here and we still didn't, we did except for Zach Eady because he was Canadian. We did not know who a player from the men's side was right. This one, we knew players and it's not just Caitlin Clark, but we're giving her the flowers because she's entering the WNBA draft April 15th. So you, you can see the stacked draft lineup there as well but it yeah a shout out to her because she had a whole state behind her she impacted not just her hometown but a lot of people across not just america i would say canada as well because a lot of people here tuned in men and women so i mean they set records when she was in the game right records L- were set, yeah last year's lsu iowa game it was a record viewers this year's lsu iowa game broke that record and then obviously the page caitlin game Broke the record. We don't know the viewers trip for the final. Yet. I think this one probably could have broken it I because don't, it's a final. Maybe who knows? Because there's a rev- the final was good. Like like I said, the games were good. This in the first half, this game was very good. It kind of died away late. The UConn uh, L- uh, Iowa game was very good. I think that was the, probably my game of the tournament in a sense. The UConn Iowa. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So it was a close game. We had a battle. But that being said, the impact she left behind is great. She's a call. If there is a college basketball Hall of Fame, I think there is an Iowa. The, hall, the college players do Hall of Fame. Sorry, colleges do Hall of Fame. She's obviously the Iowa Hall of Fame. Oh no yeah. Doubt about it. She and, already is. Uh, she is um, gonna be a college basketball goat. One of the goats, right? I still think it's Brianna. One Stewart, of the greatest. Right. Yes. But that being said. She's not the greatest, though, unfortunately. But that being said, she, so as a thank you for Caitlin Clark for getting guys like us to tune in. And enjoy women's basketball. And like you mentioned before, the WNBA, please find a way to market this well. But it takes two to tango. So consumers like us have to tune in yeah, to see sure. this as well. Right? We're not just saying it's just the WNBA. They're doing their best. They've improved. They're doing right? better and They're better. They're doing better. And the thing is now we're with Angel Reese, Camila Cardoso, Cameron Brink, uh, Takia Jackson, and now uh, and Caitlin Clark, Aliyah Edwards, right? They're going to be coming in, joining Sabrina Ionescu, joining Brianna Stewart in this league already. Already the Asia studs, Wilson, yeah. who are already there. It's going to help propel, and hopefully we could have better timings. We could see more sold-out stuff. We to try to we try to hold ourselves accountable to tune in as well. Um, to close it out officially, next year, though, Paige Beckers is right neck and neck with her. We said that before, so make sure you guys tune in because next year is still going to be fun. With whoever new name might come up, but you already have Paige Beckers and Juju Watkins leading the way, yeah. along with a coach like Don Staley and the South Carolina this squad. This just hits different in the sense of, you know, like, when you play, like, a career mode and you're, like, you go NBA career mode, then you go from the college to the pros. Yeah. It doesn't hit the same as a pro sometimes. But I think for NF, not the NBA men's side, like, the NFL and then the women's, it just hits different because you're like, damn, Trevor Lawrence was the guy. Yeah. And now... You know, he's at the pro. We're not going to witness Trevor Lawrence Clemson anymore. We're not going to witness Clayton Clark, Iowa anymore. And it's just like, damn, this is really over. And you know, it's like how people retire, you know, from professionals. Like, like Kobe retired. Like, damn, our favorite player is gone. Yeah. It's the same thing, you know, same transition. The college career is an over for Caitlin Clark, over for Camila Cardoso. And uh, Angel Reese, Cameron Brink, obviously a little bit early on in the tournament. Caitlin's teammates as well, Kate. Wilson and then Gabby Marshall as well played Kate, their last Kate, college game. Kate Morton. 
Kate Martin. Yeah, a, yeah, Kate Martin. Yeah, apologize for that. But yeah, it's like damn, you know, same thing. CJ Stroud in the NFL. Yeah, it doesn't feel the same on the men's side because they only they could be like one year and done. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, but yeah, hopefully this also the players perform because at the end of the day, it's tough to be motivated when you have a salary like that. Because I'm pretty sure Kalen Clark is gonna be making more from sponsorships because I think the rookie deal is seventy thousand. <laughs> So that's got, that sucks because like that's essentially the same amount as like a financial account and make them at work or other workplaces as well. But yeah, no, like we said, it's a huge shout out to Caitlin Clark. You know, unfo- it was unfortunate we couldn't see this with Sabrina Ionescu. At least you had the opportunity. It sucks you couldn't win it these last two years, but you were also in a program in Iowa. Um, you helped elevate, right? And that's that's what matters. And, and then there was an era, right? Like we had a bird and Tross era in college. We had a Stewie. Brianna Stewart era, we had a, the AJ Wilson year, Kelsey Plum, who was pr- the previous record holder of most points. And now we got a Caitlin and Paige era. Emphasis on and, right? It's and, yeah, and. Because we're not forgetting true hoopers know how good Paige Beckers is, right? That one game does not make her what her career is. Yeah. Right? And she's kind of come back motivated. But yeah, Caitlin in the end, WNBA first overall pick, pick and roll with Aaliyah Boston and her vision. Oh, you know, that's a that's a combo to the point where Pat McAfee's already got season tickets for next year. Oh yeah, Indiana, Indiana the, is set, bro. Yeah. With stars, you got Halliburton, Young Stud. Hopefully, Anthony Richardson. Obviously, Indiana holds the stock. Like we like Indiana teams because of the Colts too, right? Yeah, we like the Pacers. We don't. Pacers are. I've been a Pacer. Yeah. I love Paul George, Young Paul George. But yeah, no, they got now Aaliyah Boston, Caitlin Clark. You got Tyrese Halliburton. You got Anthony Richardson. Jonathan Taylor, Michael. Pittman Jonathan Jr. Taylor, Michael Pittman <laughs> Jr. <laughs> Cold squad, bro. right? So Indiana has some sports studs, on uh, in their state. Yeah, so let's see. Let's see how that goes. I'll be very, very interested for sure. You know, if, you got, if you got Pat McAfee getting season tickets, hopefully this elevates everybody. Like how Pat McAfee did it for hockey in America. Hopefully this helps with the women's yeah. game itself. Like, you know what's my? Well, I won't say dream, but like a scenario I would be hyped for is that somehow Indiana end up with the first pick again. And then we got to... I, I, I hear you. But I then you also want to see them face each other yes, as well. Yes, that's why. But like, imagine... I want to see one no. duo. Like imagine a duo. If they're on the same team, like, though. Like if it's Paige and Angel Reese versus Aaliyah Boston and, like, Caitlin Clark, I would love that, too. Yeah, no, yo, I'll, I'll see. I love that, right? I love that. But, like, imagine be. if Caitlin Clark and Paige Becker's on the same team. Same backcourt. Yeah, uh, that would be insane, for sure. Both and their movement off the ball is insane. Both their passing insane, shooting insane. So like you're like, you know, it doesn't have to be just dribbling up. One dribbles up, next time other dribbles up. And then, uh, yeah, how do you defend that? How, how? You can't face guard both of them. No. <laughs> you can't. And then you have your boss and just chilling. Yeah, imagine. <laughs> but yeah, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think that's happening. I don't think that's happening. I think, I think if I have a bold prediction, Minnesota might find a way to be shit. And then Paige returns home. Yeah. That, that's, that's my That's, that's probably my Paige's prediction. dream as well. But yeah, let's move on. To, uh, that's the end of the chapter of the women's. Like I said, WNBA draft will be insane to watch this year. So make sure we tune in for that on the 15th of April. But let's get into the men's uh, uh, the March Madness final. It's it's today, later on, right? Recording this on a Sunday. So we got to talk about the two uh, semifinals that happened. The final four matchups. DJ Burns versus Zach Eady. Unfortunately, yeah. the Cinderella run ended it, for both NC states. <laughs> yeah, both NC states. Yep, and uh, yeah, it was Purdue dominated in the second half. I guess. It's, yo, you know what this reminds me of? Kind of like this uh, madness was that year when uh, Gonzaga and Baylor. You know, there were just two teams that were just clearly yeah. the best. I mean, obviously, like and to many people's eyes, like Gonzaga was UConn. Yeah, because right? UConn. Was that team? It's supposed to be that team. Yeah, it's right. To to and they honestly, they are. Like Gonzaga because. team that had Sogs in it. If you, if people that are yeah, you know, like when the Sogs and Nemhor. Like they, they, they lost to Davion Mitchell, and the Baylor crew in Baylor that Bears. year. Baylor Bears, I think they played each other. Baylor Bears lost that year because of COVID. Um, they had players out to COVID, yeah. and they lost to Gonzaga. So they, they could have, they would have been undefeated too, right? If they didn't play each other. Yeah. But yeah, um, this year is honestly that's what it, this reminds me of. Uh, we're rooting for our boy, Zach Eady, Canadian, obviously. So oh, two-time winner. Yeah, back-to-back. Back. player of the year. Uh, f- first person since 1983. I think the only other players that have won have been a Hall of Famer. I'm not going to give him that standards yet because that's he a unfair. Hall of Famer? Is he a Hall NBA <laughs> Hall of Famer to be exact. <laughs> yeah. It's tough just because the game has changed. That, that's the only reason why I'm hesitant to say it. But, yeah, um, this game, DJ Burns obviously struggled a little bit. There was some foul trouble as well. But 
The UConn game was pretty close until it, it wasn't. Yeah, so let's talk about the UConn game because... Yeah. That, yeah, that one, it was, Bama had it, almost, opportunity. But then UConn is the same as South Carolina's women's team where they're second-half teams. Yeah, like you can tell, right? Like, when you look at the box score, 44-40 in the first half, and it was a 10-point win for them in the second half with 42-32. Yeah. Ultimately, being a 16-point victory. I think that the game was definitely hmm. closer than the scoreline showed. Yeah, for sure. It was, it was closer. Because a lot of foul game happens late and stuff, but... Yeah, no, because, like, UConn's Achilles heel, I guess, is three-point shooting, from what I heard. Bama's strength, right? Yeah, no, Sears went off for, like, 24 points yeah. for Alabama, 9 for 4. They were, like, 7 of 10 to start N- from 9 three. for 14. Yeah. Right? And then three-point-wise, he was 3 of 6. Grant Nelson dropped another 19 and 15 rebounds. Yeah. But ultimately, the boys, the two boys, well, the, honestly, the, anyone could be the boy in <laughs> UConn, but Castle and Klingon, yeah. the klingon ed center big man versus big man matchup, if you thought Burns and Edie would have been a fun one, this would be even more fun one because uh, Klingon is a beast as well. And then obviously Castle, incredible 21 points for him, 7 of 13 shooting, efficient, good scorer. And UConn is just that dominant as well. But Purdue, again, are under Virginia shit. <laughs> yeah, so um, the way Purdue wins this game is they got to make it a big lead in the first half. <laughs> yeah, if you're just if going you off the numbers, close, going off the numbers, just yeah. Just going on the history, <laughs> like going on the track record, if they keep it close, uh, I feel like UConn is just built the way to, because they won last year, mm. so they know what it takes. They're also, they're built to win um, in the second half. And if you keep it, if you have like a 20 point lead somehow going, which as a consumer might suck, right? Because we're trying to find... Yeah, close like it has to be a blowout. Right. But for them, I think that has to be the case. But no, I don't... I, even then, I think Purdue is that good that like they could handle it. The question is, how are they going to game plan around Edie? And da- Hurley's a great coach that, they, you know, Edie's so good on the post, he'll find the open guy and they have shooters around Edie. Like that's that, true. Yeah. Right? Like so they have a good the squad. Thing. They have a good so squad. So they could play him in the post and he could go for another 30 points himself, right? I don't think he needs to have 30 points to win. Like how... Caitlin Clark needed 40 to win, and she couldn't get 40. But, yeah, like the, their game plan is essentially play through Edie, and Edie makes the decision, right? And I'll be honest with you, I didn't watch enough UConn until this Bama game, but I feel like their game matchups might be a little bit similar in that sense. But if I were to go for prediction-wise, obviously a little biased, but at the same time, I said it from the beginning, they're on their Virginia shit right now. Yeah. That's part one. I feel like people are overlooking... Purdue like they did Baylor that year. Yeah, and Baylor was thought overlooked. thought UConn yeah. was going to be that team to win. And I think they were on their undefeated run that year as they well. They were undefeated, yeah. So, so for that reason, and I feel like Edie going into the draft and is trying to... Again, he's on his Caitlin Clark shit too. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> Caitlin Clark's ending wasn't the same, but give me Zach well, it could Edie. Be, it could be the give me Zach same. It could be the same. It could be the same, but yeah. I'm hoping Edie's going to hope it's not the same ending, but... Give me Zach Eady and so the we have a lot of Boilermakers. There's a lot of stories that need to be finished this weekend. Caitlin Clark, unfortunately, couldn't finish hers. Yeah. Zach Eady, for us, is going to be Zach Eady just because Canadian. Canadian. Um, let's see if we can finish this story. Another person that needs to finish the story, Cody Rhodes as well. <laughs> so out of all the three of them, who's finishing the story? Unfortunately, it's not Caitlin. But Eady or Rhodes, what do, you, what do you get more odds to? Rhodes. Yeah, it's Rhodes. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. Um, yeah, so your prediction? I, if you go I'm going with UConn still. I think they, they just, I think they are just a better team, in my opinion. But then again, who yeah, knows? The one difference between UConn and Gonzaga is Gonzaga has never won before, and they, UConn has won before. I guess that's crazy that Gonzaga has never won. They've though. been good. They've been good, like, right? Yeah. Right. So it's like this UConn team is like in a way Villanova too. Like they always find a way to win, as well. And well, good basketball program clearly. Does so. does UConn have the most since like '06 or something? Around that? Like, they're up there with Villanova, I think. Yeah, probably. Like, they're the top two, I believe. I think UConn has the most since then. Yeah, Duke won a couple, but I'm not sure uh, if... Yeah, cause Cam- Bro, Duke and Kentucky team. have fallen off now, man. <laughs> uh, Duke will be back next year, from what I know. Oh, yeah, because they, they, got got the, they got two big men. Yeah, Cooper Flag and the guy from... Uh, the African guy, I forgot his name, but... Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going with Purdue. You're going with UConn. We'll see how it goes. I hope I'm wrong. I am going for Purdue. Yeah. But... Sometimes you can't let the bias get the best of you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I always make emotional picks. But this time, I'm going to make a, a sensible pick, and I'll probably still be wrong. So I don't know how to pick him next year for my NFL pick because I did lose that. And I, that went just straight 
all right, I like this team, I like this team, I like this team, that's it. Just no thought. But this time, I'm putting a little bit of thought into it. It is UConn. Um, I'm just, like, accepting the fact that if I ever do a March Madness bracket, I will never, ever win. No one will ever win. That's the thing. One person wins. One no, person will win. There's always, like, zero. What do you mean? Oh, you're talking about, like, total points? Yeah. I'm, oh, okay. Then you're, like, like, a perfect bracket. Oh, yeah. No. No okay. chance. Nobody's getting a perfect bracket. Yeah. But, yeah. So, that wraps up our NCAA March Madness talk for this. Obviously, we'll probably have one small segment for our next pod to recap the final. But bulk of the March Madness is over. Um, we'll wait next year, next March, for this incredible tournament, long tournament. They could probably <laughs> tell from this thing that we're more prepped for the women's one because they were more interesting to watch than the men, for sure. It was. The <laughs> women's one was better. But honestly, the men's one did did good this year. Yeah. La- compared to last year, last couple of years, the men's one did good. All for right. Sure. S- slight NBA news, but still NCAA. Let's just lead with that here right now. Bronny James is officially de- to declared two things. He's declared for the NBA draft as well as the tra- he has also entered the transfer portal. So which means he's eligible for both. I think obviously he has a deadline to commit for the draft as well. Similar to what Edie did last year, I'm assuming. I hope he doesn't go to the NBA. That's just me because like his numbers weren't the greatest. He's obviously coming off that uh, health scare. And on top of that, I just feel like he might need to learn a little bit more. I think the pressure for him is the whole and the media wise, it's the LeBron side of things. Maybe he could be a good pro, I don't know. But for me, I think it's just best to have a fresh start at another school. And seeing what Pee Wee the Plug said, uh, um, Pierre from Big Stacks Porzingis from uh, Numbers on the Board, I think who, uh, who I listen to for college stuff, I think he said Baylor's a good fit for him for the style he plays. Yeah, so that, that's my. As simple as this. Stay in college. <laughs> yeah. All right. It, it just It's a firm decision. You need to develop more. You couldn't have that college year this year due to your health, right? You need to have a little bit more time developing. And also, right? is that LeBron is lying. He's not retiring next year. <laughs> he has, LeBron has to. No, Shams did come out and say he has another two years maybe. Yeah. So that's perfect. You play college next year. LeBron's final year. You get drafted. LeBron and Bronny on the same team. Boom. Perfect ending. Right. So There's no pressure. I think he needs to stay in college, uh, personally. And uh, USC do not have their coach anymore. It's Arkansas's coach now. USC's coach went to SMU. Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. My my overall thoughts on this. Yeah. Don't don't. I say stay in college, right? And I just hate like he's gonna get hate. Like he he's gonna have haters because of the name James at the end of the day, <laughs> and he's like, gonna have unnecessary attention type of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Right? And. <laughs> I think he just needs to go to college for one more year and see how it goes and then decide that way. If he chooses the NBA, let's see how it goes because obviously it's a business move for NBA teams, right? Your squad could help with that. Just get Bronny and or get Or if he does go to the NBA, a team like yours, a team like... Um, Nobody's th- wasting a top 10 pick on him. No, that's not Nobody's wasting first round pick on him. you guys have later on picks, right? Like I'm saying, like teams that have good s- development programs. I think you guys are up there. Um, what was the other team? OKC. Okay, see, yeah. As well, and... Uh, but I feel like it makes sense for a team that's, like, you know, kind of on the, like, a Rockets type of thing, you know? Like Yeah, that's another team I was going to say. Like, you know, teams that are, like, in the bubble, but, like, just need the extra step, then you get LeBron James, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, th- it makes sense for them to, like, draft LeBron. It doesn't make sense no, for No, it's not Raptors. guaranteed LeBron will team up with them. He's teaming up with them. We're assuming that will be the case. It will be the case. We'll just <laughs> see what they want, but... Yeah, it, it's just unnecessary. Maybe there hasn't been a father-son doing the NBA, though, right? No. That's so it might be the first, but I got an, is that a good thing or a bad thing? We'll there will be the first. There will be the first, but again, is it going to be a good thing or a bad thing in terms of development? We'll see how that goes yeah, no. for him. So the for the business side of things, it's going to be a great thing. <laughs> that's for sure. I know. You got to hope it's some Ken Griffey Sr., Ken Griffey Jr. shit. Yeah. <laughs> and in this case, right, that's the best case scenario for Bronny. <laughs> but let's move on to other NBA news. Julius Randle is unfortunately out for the season, suffering a season-ending soldier shoulder surgery. And this really hampers the Knicks as because the trio of Randall, Ananobi, and Brunson was turned out to be incredible, but injuries have limited them playing together. And the uh, Knicks was one of our teams that like you know could be that 0-4 Pistons, that underdog team got, that could just win out of nowhere. Yeah, that's not the case anymore. So I could still kind of see it because Brunson's mm. that good, and as long as Andrew will be healthy, 
But yeah, you're right. You need a secondary guy at times, and that's Julius Randle. I don't know if he's not going to be your secondary scorer, though. Yeah, Julius Randle hasn't had the greatest playoff success himself. Either, that's true, yeah. Number-wise, so that's the only reason why I'm saying it. But yeah, you still need him, in my opinion. Um, the Knicks were 12-2 and with Randle and OG both in the lineup. So that's the thing. Josh Hart's been playing 48 minutes a game, running up and down. But yeah, no, we'll, we'll see how this goes for the Knicks overall. We're Miles McBride playing 48 minutes as well. Yes, and that's the Tibbs way, though, unfortunately. Yeah, that is the Tibbs way. But yeah, so, so we'll see how that goes. Again, we'll talk more on next episode once we have the playoff races getting closer. The play-ins should be starting on the 15th as well. So we'll see how that goes. Other quick news. Hall of Fame we mentioned last time uh, anyways, but we're going to quickly mention the official names that we know. It is obviously confirmed. Vince Carter, Chauncey Billups, uh, Jerry West, Michael, Michael Cooper. Cooper, who I was surprised was not in this whole time. Uh, it was a top defensive guy for those Showtime Lakers teams. Are officially in. Other names, Simone Augustus, Herb Simon, Doug Collins, Bo Ryan, Walter Davis, Charles Smith, Dick Barnett, Harley Redden, and Michelle Timms. So, Congrats to all the Hall of Famers. All the Hall of Fame class being led by Vince Carter, my boy. And <laughs> yeah, congratulations, everyone. And uh, well deserved. And uh, yeah, Hall of Fame, big accomplishment at the end of the day. <laughs> Speaking of injuries, let's talk about baseball very quick, uh, quickly. This, uh, this will be a little brief. Well, now we're on the series in type thing. Three series in, yeah. Now we're on our quick fire topics. Yeah, baseball is one of them. And injuries. Shane Bieber highlighting the big one. He is out for the year or next year and a half, he is having Tommy John surgery. Spencer Strider was on a 15-day IL. So he kind of... He has UCL damage or UCL injury, which is Tommy John. Yeah. So don't be surprised if he's going to need it. At the end of the day, he's going to need it, right? So once you see UCL, you're just like essentially like, even if it's 15-day IL, he's not coming back in 15 days. It's just not. Yeah, so here's the thing. The same same thing happened with Garrett Cole and he's out longer, right? So... Here's my thing, right? I'm going to ask you a couple questions because there are a couple of article came out. Yeah, I MLB saw one PA thing. head blames pitch clock for elbow injuries. That's the one I saw, yeah. That's one. There's a Chris Bassett um, interview that he did saying that, you know, MLB made the standard of 97 miles per hour is the precedent, even if they have a high ERA, instead of a guy who could pitch 91 fine location and have a low ERA. Because, like, those guys get cut or are in practice squads, whatever their version of whatever practice yeah, squad yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, minor league rosters and they don't get called back so what are your thoughts on this because um apparently the mlb said the when doing or they said it's doing research to see what the in- injuries are and but they incited by john hopkins i found no evidence to support the introduction of the pitch clock has increased the injuries keep in mind the pitch cl- clock also decreased its time coming into this year as well by a couple of seconds yeah i think i don't think it's pitch clock i I just don't think because at the end of the day you're still throwing the same amount of pitches, right? Yes, you have a little bit rest, lesser rest, but like at the end of the day your job is done quicker, right? Like when no, you think, we are not medical scientists. Here, yeah, no, but I'm if I'm just predicting, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when you have like yes, you have rest between the reps, right? For sure, but you're like say you're th- eighty-eight pitches is still eighty-eight pitches, right? The thing with the without the pitch clock, eighty-eight pitches will take you like two hours, aka six innings. Say like that takes like two hours. With the pitch clock, that takes an hour 15. I guess they just get a hour longer and a rest what, in between pitches. I know, but... That's all it is. So, like, there's like there's both ways. Where, like, when you look at it, you got rest between pitches without the pitch clock, but then your night is done earlier with the pitch clock as well. So you have more rest between your next start as well. But I guess the, what they're looking at is, like, the rest in between isn't long enough, right, for them to have. Because at the end of the day, the gap of the games are still going to be the same. Right, like if if you're doing a five day thing, you're still gonna be pitching in five days. I know, but you got the extra hour. <laughs> True, but like yeah, no, like, like it's just both ways. Obviously, my I'm just like, I, it is a stretch what I just said. Don't get me wrong with the with, um with the pitch clock. I well, just don't, I don't think because at the end of the day, ninety pitches is still ninety pitches. And has there has there been an increase in injuries in the last couple of years? Yes, compared to this, like. Yes. That's but the, is the, that the, it was, I, I don't have the thing saved but there's like a bunch but of so injuries. there's been an increase in injuries yeah. so obviously yeah so it's, it's definitely something you gotta look at yeah but it's gonna really tarnish what MLB uh, has not been taking done. it away because they can't the take ratings it away. went high they right? can't afford to take but it but what away. about the Chris Bassett comments that makes more sense that like if, if you're throwing 97 right ultimately you're gonna 
your arm's gonna feel it, bro. Yeah. <laughs> right. Every single pitch, or essentially like every other pitch, because depending on what type of pitcher you are, right. Whereas like if you have the Bassett style, like, why do you think Hyunjin Ryu lasted so long in the league, right? Why do you think Hyunjin Ryu, um, was actually good when he came back from Tommy John surgery? Because he didn't throw his arm out throwing freaking ninety seven, like this his yeah. entire career. Other pitchers, I don't think Verlander threw ninety seven. Then again, I could be wrong. Yeah. DeGrom, I think DeGrom throws like 98, 99, and he's been injured a lot. So yeah, so I think it's I think an interesting debate because if it is a pitch clock thing, then you're risking business. If it's a, a fandom and ratings, if it's a, it, but I, I agree with the more Bassett take because it's like, yeah, they're precedenting velocity. And like I said, we're Jays fans, we're saying that we wanted a guy like Jordan Hicks. Now, granted, we need one or two guys like that. You that still need, mean, like, you need a mix. Need everybody. You need a mix. Right? Because we have Chris Bassett, we have Kevin Gosman. Those are, like, Kevin Gosman pitch, when healthy pitches faster. Chris Bassett is a location guy. Jose Barrios is, like, more on the fa- velocity side. He's a Kikuchi, mix. He's a, Jose Barrios is a mix. Kikuchi isn't, yeah. I believe. Kikuchi has 97. Never mind. <laughs> th- 96, at least, I think. Uh, But, like you said, Ryu wasn't that last year. When and Ryu was started. a great pitcher. Yeah. It was just, right. like, the one time he got injured. Was like with the Jays. Like I, I don't think he had an injury history. With I'm the not. Jays. I I could be mistaken, right? But I think Ryu that was his only Tommy John. And that's what I'm saying. That I, I think that's the only major injury I think he had. Yeah, because he was pitching all these times yeah. for the Dodgers, right? So, and he was able to get a, like a fat contract. Like who gets a like a you got forty a or eighty? Yeah, who gets that when you're thirty three? Yeah, like unless you're like you know high end. Now, granted, unavailable. Jays were also overpaying for a reason, but yeah, that's true. But at the end, of the day, like Ryu lived up to it. Yeah, I think I personally believe Ryu lived up to the contract. Yeah, I think he did too. Yeah, but yeah, no, it's definitely will keep something to keep an eye on for. See more reports. And it is an interesting topic because baseball is the sport when it comes. Every sport has sports science for a reason, but baseball pitching is definitely something. Well, to look baseball at. is like it has to be more science. Of the and like is higher on the analytical side yeah. as well for like game plans and stuff like that. All right. If you're in Oakland and you're not really visiting or you're not a visiting team guy, uh, there's no point in showing up <laughs> because they have officially will be moving to uh, Sacramento before they get the official Vegas move in tw- um, 2027. So 2025 to 2027, they will be playing in Sacramento at Sutter Health Park in West Sacramento. Uh, there's an option for the A's to play a fourth season at Sutter Health Park, according to a statement from the Kings, uh, NBA Sacramento Kings, um, obtained by the Athletics Evan Drellick. So if you're in, o- sorry, it just as the park itself has over 10,000 seats with grass outfield uh, seats, including capacity, increasing capacity to 14,000. The Oakland Coliseum had 46k, obviously, because it's a major league stadium, and yeah. Um. So. Oakland should sell out every single game this season. To fi- <laughs> no. <laughs> if I'm Oakland, no. <laughs> no, like, you don't, so the fans get the owner of the funds. You get the fans. <laughs> you get the owner of the funds. No. That's the why they're not going to do it. No, obviously. Uh, MLB PA still needs to sign off, though, on playing in a major league. Like, you uh, know what? You know, league this is the last time we're getting Oakland baseball. Right? Yeah. So, so like, sell out the stadium. That's what I'm saying. If you're a visiting fan. Sell out the stadium. If you're a visiting fan are, or in that area, just go to Oakland. for. So, the like, the last series that Oakland plays this season. Should be sold out. That one, yeah I'll, yeah, I'll agree with that. But it's again, it's just or last it's, home it's just series, such a yeah. big fu to the face, though. <laughs> like I'm showing up for this, and the team's not good at all. So that's the other issue. Yeah, but, <coughs> Oakland yeah. has some history, right? Yeah, they have history. Right, that's what I learned in that short challenge that you gave me with yeah. the top, the top uh, championships in sports. In sports, I do not know Oakland will be up there for sure. Yeah. But yeah. All right, to close it out, EPL title race. And uh, Man United were involved. No, well, not for the title. Oh yeah, no, they were involved today. They were involved today. Big we, result in the title race. Liverpool, who had been in control, had the advantage the last couple of weeks, last month, I would say, have now lost that advantage due to goal difference. They have the same points as Arsenal, but Arsenal has goal difference advantage, and that is due to a two-two draw to Manchester United, who dropped two points. Uh yeah, Liverpool dropped and two points. Seven overall points. <laughs> oh yeah, United just just suck. Yeah. But we're talking about title race, so we should not bring up United <laughs> because That's only they're, United we're bring up. they're nowhere near it. Um, so this is a big drop in Liverpool. Obviously, we watched the game just because our team was involved, and uh, the biggest key in Liverpool's draw was missed chances. And I said this before, Liverpool are the worst team when it comes to four v two, five v two counterattacks. They did that against Arsenal when they drew. 
at Anfield, which I believe will cost them. And right now, it is costing them at this moment. Um, Arsenal, I mean, City and City usually end up winning, right? But this but year, been, they haven't. They, they haven't been. A, they haven't been City. Yeah. Um, all three do have the European competitions to play as well, so it's not like anyone has an advantage of rest. Except City and Arsenal have the bigger ones. Oh yeah, City and Arsenal have the bigger ones. And UCL, UCL is back this weekend. Byron and Arsenal kicking it off on Tuesday. Um. So yeah, those are my thoughts on that. Like Liverpool, th- you know they're not gonna have. They might not have the Klopp finale season, right? Send off Klopp on I a good note, right? I really hope they don't. Just as rivals, um, is due to the fact that they just blow opportunities after yeah. opportunity, and they did that both games in Manchester United. They did it against Arsenal in both games, losing one to Arsenal and drawing one to Arsenal, and yeah, just you gotta finish your chances, bro. You gotta score goals. Right, United had zero shots in the first half. You had seventeen. It took United two shots to get back in the game. Yeah, I know. If you can't beat United, you can't win the league. If they do somehow win the league, well, then the other teams are just you guys are you guys suck. <laughs> yeah, it's simple. It, it's honestly true. Like if you can't beat United, you, you can't win the league. City beat United. Arsenal beat well, United. Arsenal has one more, but yeah. But uh, they already did that. They already and had. Si- and uh, like honestly, like, we beat we tied Liverpool twice in the league, and we beat them in the FA Cup. Yeah. So like. You gotta beat up on shit teams, and I'm roasting. <laughs> 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 you gotta beat up on the shit teams, bro. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm not gonna argue against it. I, I mean, I'm out of tune with the Man United season already. I'm out of tune with the J season. I'm already looking forward to all the freaking off season dra- no, drama. drama, transfer drama. We're like, oh, we're about to get this good guy, this good guy, and then end up panic buying Casemiro somehow. And uh, yeah, but honestly, title run. It's funny to see that City's third right now, <clears throat> but City haven't been that great. No, that they haven't been city, and right now, it's tough. I'm I'm still gonna stick with city. I'm not gonna change my prediction because somehow they always find a way. Yeah, but it's it's a toughest it's a toughest race they've been in for sure. One because there's three teams involved. Two, Arsenal is still healthy. Liverpool is still getting well. Liverpool got healthy when they got Salah back as well. Um, obviously Allison is still out for them, unfortunately. But at the end of the day, City does have the greatest depth. The last two months of the season, our cousins had it perfectly. That's when injuries happen. So we'll see what happens there. Yeah. Um, like I said, City's playing Madrid. So that's pretty much whoever wins that should win the Champions League. So that's a big moment there. So we don't know what they're going to prioritize accordingly, health and all that stuff as well. So, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Before we close it out in soccer, quick breaking news. Uh, talking about more next episode is in terms of playoff implications, all Teams in the East and West, top 10 teams are locked. For? So, the Rockets officially lost. Oh, so for the NBA. NBA. Okay. Um, the top 10, yeah, top 10 teams. Um, yeah, yeah. They're, they're locked. <laughs> and uh, we'll see, rankings are the only, we'll see how the rankings look. But as of right now, 10 East, 10 West teams, they're all locked. 20 playoff teams. And there'll be some. Slash play in teams, yeah. yeah. So, we'll talk more next episode. But going back, let's to close it out. Canada soccer, two things with Canada soccer. The She Believes Cup is going on. And the the wo- Canadian woman came back to win in PKs against Brazil, taking on the USA, and hopefully on Tuesday night, hopefully not a rainy pitch. Yeah, um, <laughs> even though that puddle or game, wet pitch, I guess. that puddle game was fun. Yeah, but let's let the let's let the player showcase the uh, scale uh, scale down, <laughs> and obviously it was fun to see that shootout and all that stuff. But yeah, Canada, let's see if they get their revenge. Shout out to Jasmine. Yeah, shout out Jasmine. Sorry on TV. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? She got showed on TV. She was a camera. Was, just threw me off. All right, <laughs> last card the soccer news. All right, <coughs> uh, men's national team coach Hunt. We don't know what it's gonna be like. Again, we still don't think it should be more Bayolo as much as he is in the race. Nothing against him. I'm sure he's a nice guy, but we're talking strictly business here. Oh yeah, talking strictly was, business. It wasn't a great performance against. We Trinidad. mentioned last time a surprise name could be Thierry Henry, but that wasn't really backed by crazy sources. However, this one, Frank Lampard is a surprise name on the list of candidates to be the next Canadian men's head coach, according to the Telegraph's Matt Law. Canada Soccer wants to hold talks with former Chelsea and England midfielder, um, also their former uh, Chelsea manager as well, and Derby County. However, it remains to see if Lampard is interested in working with the cash-strapped federation. So that's the big thing there. If he accepts the job, Lampard would lead the men's team to the 2026 World Cup which Canada is obviously co-hosting uh, in North America with the USA and Mexico. So, 
Yeah, Franklin Lampard has been a legend. All right, right in the soccer. Check. <laughs> I'm sure he's right. That's <laughs> it. Just uh, um, he's a legend in the soccer world, just not a legend in the coaching world at the moment. And uh, I'm a, I, I, I don't know how to feel about this. You're wrong, by the way. Uh, oh, obviously I'm wrong. <laughs> right. Um, but it's Frank and James Lampard. Yeah. But uh, Lampard, I think he could. I think this could be like a coach career, coach reviving opportunity. Like if Lampard does good. So we get Lampard. Lampard does great. He's not staying with us long. If he does good, he's kicking. Yes. He yeah. But this, could, I think, could be a good revival opportunity for his coaching career. Do you think that too? Yeah, because like he did well with Derby. That's why he got the Chelsea opportunity. So it's a good development thing. Again, I don't like. No one thinks that Canada um, is a top tier nation to win a World Cup. They're right? not. Yeah. But they're a top tier team in Concacaf. To win a Nations League or a, uh, or a goal. Some club. sort of trophy now. You got to right? win something. Like it's not like it's no longer just USA and Mexico. Like they're in that mix, right? World Cup-wise, can they make noise in Copa America? Maybe, right? Can they have those Cinderella runs like Morocco did? Maybe. But again, yeah, it's a good revival opportunity for him, right? Henri did that with Montreal. He was okay. But again, like the top, like again, is Alfonso Davies a superstar in the soccer world? No. In terms of Canada soccer, he's a superstar. There's, there's two different things, right? So, yeah, I think this could be a good opportunity for him to revive himself, right? Phil Neville is now, I think, the Portland head coach, so I don't think it would have mattered. He could have been a guy to revive himself here, but he struggled with Inter-Miami before Messi got there to be... Uh, he got fired before Messi got there. Yeah. That's probably the worst opportunity, yeah. the worst thing that could but ever happen. Yeah, so we'll see how that goes. He is, again, a great midfield mind, so a guy, that's where they struggled a bit. He could help there. And we'll see how tacticians go, right? He struggled with Chelsea both times, right? Yeah, yeah, he did. And uh, with Derby, I hmm. think he did very well. That's why he got that opportunity. So, so, so you know, he might be good with a young squad, you know, who don't don't, don't spend a lot. Maybe yeah. maybe he doesn't have to maybe he doesn't have to deal with the spending, right? Getting new players in, in the sense of like you know now you have Canada players getting out, you know Lampard should call up our uh, Jeevan right like instantly, <laughs> and then, you know start developing Jeevan as a midfielder, and their midfield issue gone, done. Simple as that. Yeah. Shout out to even though. K- uh, game today, later on, Sunday. but Playing LA Galaxy 2 team. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, we'll see how that goes. It's interesting to see that we are linked to big names, which is weird. But again, like I like I agree with Peter Galindo before uh, he took the TFC job. When he came on the podcast a couple of times, make, maybe get a CPL guy, or maybe a Canadian bread guy, just have a guy that could lead the line. Or not lead the line. The guy that could just lead the team. Just like command some res- guy who could command respect for sure and manage egos for sure, but yeah, uh, I'll be interested to see how this goes. I think like if Mauro Bielo goes into, I'll get I'll, at the very minimum, I'll give him that opportunity of Copa America. I don't want to, but I think that's the only way he'll get changed because if he gets smoked with them, he'll be gone. Argentina's and we might have a friendly with <laughs> France. We already have one lined up with the Netherlands. So well. we got good friendlies lined up. So good preparation for the so tournament. So if that was the case, I think we need to... Then that, That's kind of interesting for me to get. I'm telling you this right now. If we get whooped by France and Netherlands, <laughs> we're out in like two games in Copa America. Yeah. If we get like dominated like 4-0, 5-0... We're done. Like, there's no hope yeah, for, yeah. like, don't have hope for Copa America. If we're losing to France and um, Netherlands, what hope are you going to have for our Yeah, team? again, even, for, again, Copa America, I'm not even looking at it to, like, I'm just looking at it to see the prep for the World Cup and just see football. I just Better play football. games, right? But at that's the end of the day, like, that's a tournament. Results do matter. Don't get me wrong. Results matter Results in the sense of, matter. like, Copa America, you got to get out of the group. You have to. Yeah. Right? There's no excuse for you not to. World Cup makes sense, right? Because that's the whole world. Like, Copa America, it's easier in the sense of group stage. Harder in the knockout stage. Yeah, and this is a new Copa America too, so I think we got to see how it, how it goes. But yeah, no, it, it'll be fun to see what happens, uh, right? So yeah, we'll, we'll end it there. Uh, once again, we appreciate you guys, everybody, for watching. Please, please go check out that banger new video we dropped, um, the Canucks game, Dave Canucks game vlog, mixed with um, uh, trivia questions and questions to fans and all that. That will be that's our last video. So make sure you guys uh, hit that subscribe button for more content like that. We'll try to go to local uh, events around the league. It doesn't have to be a professional sports event. Maybe if the playoff watch party exists, the Canucks are in the playoffs. So we, we might go see, you know, head over to either Scott Road or... Uh, uh, after you know, that Scott Road, a yeah. Series or a watch party in Vancouver. We'll see how that goes. We'll try our best to get it done. Uh, we enjoyed it as well, uh, as much as uh, it was... Uh, 
out of our comfort zone. A, a comfort zone and an experience, but no, we did we did enjoy it. Shout out all everybody that was involved in that video, especially uh, Crazy P, and uh, 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 make sure you guys um, check out. Some, get my words back. Make sure you guys. <laughs> Uh, check out our Instagram, TikToks, and YouTube Shorts. So hit the follow button for those, and subscribe even our Twitter. We're gonna po- post it on the X as well. Uh, we're gonna be clipping moments from uh, their specific interviews on there as well. So make sure you guys check that out. Audio listeners, we appreciate you guys always downloading.